Our gracious God in heaven, we thank you for this Lord's Day. And we thank you for the blessing that you call us to worship you. That you appoint one day out of seven for worship of you. That you in fact direct our hearts and our minds to focus upon you and so worship you. So we ask by the help of your Holy Spirit that you would lead us to do that very thing and that you would use even this class even this very short study, and even our meeting that is to follow this class, use all of this to prepare our hearts and minds for assembled worship. For that is our heart's desire. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're just going to look today at rejection number three. Rejection number three. So the handout that you have in front of you, that's all all that should be printed on that. Uh, If that's not what's on there, then you may have an old handout. But uh, we're just going to look at Rejection 3, and I have titled this, Perseverance and Falling from Grace. Perseverance and Falling from Grace. Now, I am going to presume as we jump into this, that you have been a part of this study either through the online lectures or through the lectures that we have had here. Uh, And so there's a lot that I'm presuming as we dive into this that that you already know, that we've already covered in prior uh, studies. Uh, But let's look at this again with a rejection. The first thing that is stated, and I have it there in italics for you, is the, re- the argument of the remonstrance. That's the traditional Arminian argument. Uh, and the second part that is not in italics is uh, the response of the Synod of Dort. All right. That, the, what, what does the Synod reject? That the true believers and regenerate not only can fall from justifying faith and likewise from grace and salvation wholly and to the end, but indeed often do fall from this and are lost forever. <clears throat> All right, how did the, the Synod respond to this? For this conception makes powerless the grace, justification, regeneration, and continued keeping by Christ, contrary to the expressed words of the Apostle Paul, quote, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. And contrary to the Apostle John, quote, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. End quote. Uh, that's 1 John 3 9. And also, contrary to the words of Jesus Christ, quote, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them to me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. That's John 10, 28, and 29. All right, so the argument is that God's sovereign election does not preserve. And remember, this fifth head of doctrine, that's the main thing that we have been focusing on, is perseverance or preservation. Pre, that's not the word. I, well, yeah. Preserve or preservation. That election does not preserve, <clears throat> nor is justification or adoption unchangeable, nor the seal of the Holy Spirit is a guarantee. Rather, salvation may be forfeited. Now, first of all, uh, is this a doctrine that is alive and well today? Yes. Now, let's pause here for just a second and say most modern Arminians, and so, uh, well, I'm not even going to name denominations, but most modern Arminians actually have created a a hybrid theology. In in other words, uh, what we see in the traditional form of the arguments of the disciples of Jacob Arminius argued in the remonstrance 
the traditional Armenian argument actually you don't see very often in its purest form. Uh, in other words, there are a lot of churches today who would hold to a uh, Arminianistic soteriology, meaning an Arminian type of, of view of how we are saved, but in this area they would wholeheartedly reject it. And you've probably come from out of perhaps out of churches like that or come in contact with them where they'll say, well, it's man's choice to believe and yet they'll defend tooth and nail that uh, once saved, always saved. And, and so, so we don't necessarily see this argued as much today. But yes, there are, as you, you've all agreed with me, there are denominations alive and well today who hold to this lock, stock and barrel that you can in fact lose your salvation, that the Holy Spirit is, as is, is I like to say, and, and again, I'm, I'm saying this uh, with sarcasm, is kind of a, a jump and jump off uh, presence of God. He just kind of jumps on you and, and you experience it and then He jumps off of you and then He's on to do His next deed among someone else. And, and so the idea here is, is that, that just as your salvation is your choice, so also it is your uh, choice or, or your activity involvement in preserving your salvation. Well, <clears throat> you can see here by the response in this rejection, what does this push back against? I mean, what are some of the traditional doctrines that we hold dear that uh, present a problem for the Arminian argument? Well, Let's just walk through the Ordo Salutis. The Ordo Salutis is just a fancy way of saying order of salvation. Uh, what, what would, how would the Arminian argument that you can lose your salvation, um, how would that present a problem for the traditional uh, understanding of election? I mean, if God, if God predestined someone unto salvation, then the Arminian argument is saying what? Yeah, that's right. And that's exactly what they've, they've done is, is they've said, well, He didn't really predestine our salvation. Rather, what He did is He predestined that you might be able to have the option to exercise your choice, Right? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what they, they argued. Instantly, you can see why Arminianism thrives in American Christianity. Number two, in addition to election, let's think about this. How about regeneration? How does the Arminian argument present a problem for the traditional understanding of regeneration? Yeah, I mean, think about this. It, so re regeneration is taken from the Greek word, which from, is where we get the term born again. Uh, Gegeneros, I think, is, is the Greek word. And so we are, we are born. So if I am born again through the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, and yet I can lose what God did in bringing me to birth, does that mean that spiritually I go from death to life, to death, to life, to death, to life based on what I do? I mean, think about that. I mean, that, that is a very difficult concept uh, and one of the reasons why the uh, Armenian argument just simply won't hold up to Scripture. We see here, incidentally, that they, they quote three different passages of Scripture to push back against. It's actually pretty easily refuted. Yes? Yeah, exactly. That is part of their argument. That's exactly right. That because you believe and that because that belief then God in response gives you that life, then because the faith precedes the life, ergo they believe that, well, then you can sin and that life goes away. But again, even if, let's just, even, let's just so walk down that road as you've rightly argued so does that mean that, we, that a person, a believer or unbeliever, could, could vacillate in a state between life and death at any given moment? 
I mean, again, it's just, it just doesn't seem to, to correspond with the idea that, that when, I mean, you just think about this. When Jesus says, I came that they might have life, right? And, and so, um, again, it's just foreign to the concept of regeneration. Again, as J.D. argued, uh, the Arminian argument is that faith precedes regeneration. We believe that regeneration precedes and is the cause of faith, but regardless... Regardless, there still is a conflict between the concepts of life and death. Or how about this? How about justification? If I am justified by God's grace uh, through faith in Christ, it means that I am in right standing with God. So, does that mean that if I sin, a sin that is egregious enough, which is difficult to define, isn't it? Uh, but nevertheless, let's send, I send a, a sin egregious enough that somehow now my legal standing has changed. That all of a sudden, well, it was that bad, John. And, and so now all of a sudden you, you were in right standing. But, it, but again, does that mean then that I go from legal right standing to not, to, not, to? Or the one that really grips me. And this is the one that I think is just so compelling. So you're telling me, the Armenian are you're telling me that uh, I have, by God's grace, through faith in Christ, I've been justified as righteous and I have been adopted into the family of God. And you're telling me that if I sin, whatever sin you've imagined that is vile enough, that God will unadopt me? But, but if I get my act back together and I exercise my faith, then as my right, then I get my adoption back. So are, are, they, are they arguing that somehow between believing in Christ and our death that we vacillate between being a child of God and not being a child of God at any moment in time? You see, the problem is not only is the Arminian argument contrary to Scripture, but it undermines who God is and what He has done. Think about this, and this is why, and, and again, if we could just carry this on out uh, in terms of the ordo salutis, sanctification, uh, and then finally, uh, glorification. Um, if we just carry this on out, think about this. The Arminian argument says, God has elected an option for you. Uh, hopefully, you take advantage of it. Uh, if you take advantage of it, then you're born again. You get spiritual life, and, and it complements that, that spark of life that's already in you. And so it's a, it's a good partnership. Uh, you're, you're justified, thankfully, because you made the right decision. You're justified before God. And because you're justified by God and your, your right choice, good job. You get adopted into the family of God. Uh, keep on keeping on uh, because if you can do enough good and that outweighs the bad and you just don't do that really bad one, you know, just whatever that is, um, then uh, don't do that really bad one, then, uh, well, then you'll reach glory. You'll be, you'll be glorified in the end. I mean, again, I, I, again, I know I'm being facetious and, and, and a bit derogatory, but here's where I'm going. Now, think about the Reformed understanding. God hath predestined us before the foundation of the world, having nothing to do with us, but God's own free grace, His good pleasure for His own glory. He has brought us to life not by virtue of our works, nor by anything that we have done, nor by anything foreseen in God, but rather He has brought us to life through the regenerating work of His Holy Spirit monergistically. Furthermore, He has given us the gift of faith to believe on Him by His grace. We are justified as right before Him. In fact, He even gives us, because we are not capable of producing anything in and of ourselves, He even gives us Christ's righteousness imputed to us by faith, and we stand before Him as perfectly spotless and righteous. Furthermore, we are brought into the family of God. We are even made joint heirs with Christ 
a secure adoption that is guaranteed, in fact, has been guaranteed in us by the Holy Spirit who doesn't jump on and jump off, but indwells us as the permanent, everlasting, unto eternity guarantee of our adoption to enable us to obey Him to God's glory. He, by His Spirit, is constantly at work in us. Reforming, uh, refining us and conforming us to the Spirit of Christ and we will one day be in glory with perfect bodies, without sin, reigning with Christ to the glory of God forever and ever. Who gets the glory and a right understanding of the Ordo Salutis? That's right. And, and so the, the point is, is it's not just. It's not just you know, well, they've just, got, they've just got a little different view on how someone... No, no. I mean, granted, I, we do need to show respect to our brothers and sisters in Christ who disagree with us in our soteriology. But folks, we don't need to shy away from our reformed understanding of the gospel. Why? Because it glorifies God. God gets the glory in everything that I just described from our election to our glorification and that's as it should be. And now, let's pray. We're going to a congregational meeting and uh, I'm already over time. <laughs> our gracious God in heaven, we do thank you uh, that it is nothing in ourselves uh, that we are saved nor that we persevere unto the end, but it is all by your grace. And so that leads us to worship. We don't worship ourselves. We worship you and you alone. And so we ask that you would prepare our hearts and our minds for worship this morning. We pray now in Jesus' name. Amen.